Hi, my name's Debbie Handley uh, and I'm the facilitator for the Tuffy Cymru Vegetable Network. Welcome to everybody um, watching this video. We're absolutely delighted to have Charles Dowding with us today. Um, he's the leading authority on no-dig gardening um, and has been for almost 40 years um, and he's become the go-to source for Grow Your Own um, advice. So we're absolutely delighted to have him here doing his, uh, his uh, presentation today. Just to give you a bit of background, Tevi Cymru uh, supports commercial growers across Wales um, and in, we offer kind of one-to-one -one tech advice, um, training and events which obviously we're online at the moment um, and the support tailored to your own business needs. So if there's anything that comes from this please do get in touch and we're happy to support you and can support you 100% funded um, going forward for your, for your business needs. Um, this video will last approximately an hour and a half um, and there is a follow-up session next week uh, on Thursday the 11th at one o'clock where is, it's a live session and you'll be able to ask Charles any questions, burning questions that you have from the video today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Charles uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing this presentation. Thanks Charles. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I wish it could be in person, but this is pretty good alternative. And I must say thank you to all of the people who've helped to set this up as well. It's uh, been a bit of a learning curve. <laughs> and uh, here is my slideshow. So I, I want to share with you the, the, the ease and potential success of no dig and how it can be scaled up to a certain point, <clears throat> as well as scaled down, in fact. And, in my lifetime, I've been kind of scaling down really since since I was in my late twenties. I was running a market garden at that point of uh, seven and a half acres, three hectares, and employing some people. And actually, find it quite stressful. I have to say, um, the larger you are in your operation, the more demands there are on your time from all directions. And there's something to be said for staying small. Small is beautiful and managing things really tightly, uh, which is what I'm doing now at Homemakers, where I'm cropping just a quarter of an acre, about a thousand square meters. That includes the pathways. And from that, my sales are around 20,000 pounds a year. Uh, however, the, you know, this is still not hugely profitable and I couldn't be making this pay if I didn't have other sources of income, you know, which is a bit unusual to me. Like, YouTube and giving talks and things, writing. Um, but do bear in mind that my garden is not set up to be fully commercial. So the pictures I'm showing you are not of the most efficient setup, uh, but what they, they serve to illustrate is the methods you can use and then scale up and implement in, in the way that will work for you. So um, take, take the knowledge that's kind of locked in here you, you've got to then work out how best to apply it in your situation. Just for example, I, I like my garden to look really beautiful. Um, that looks great on Instagram photos. <laughs> you know, so there are a few considerations like that. And it, that means sometimes we've got beds of, um, say, lettuce dotted around. Um, I'm, I'm also doing trials, which means I've got little bits and pieces of vegetables dotted around the garden in different trials. And when it comes to picking them, that's taking more, more time than would be the case if you had it all together. You can still have a beautiful garden. And actually, no dig is fantastic for, for making a beautiful space. And I feel that this is important. You know, it, it's not all about money. Uh, it links in because if you can create a beautiful space, you, you, you'll, you'll want to be out there more. Uh, you know, my history is when I started out in 1982, I went around quite a few organic market gardens and in those days organic was revolutionary and new and not everybody really understood how to translate it to a commercial setting and what I was seeing was a lot of weeds. I was just completely bowled over by the amount of weeds that these guys were having to deal with and mostly they were using machinery like old-fashioned disc harrows and uh, weeding scrapers going between the rows and yeah you know, ultimately that wasn't really good for soil and I you know you then I found myself thinking well is this how organic is this there's a lot of 
tilling and cultivating going on. So that's when I got interested in no dig and the potential to reduce weeds. And that is, I think, the biggest trump card of no dig is you will notice in all my slides you may have seen already, you know, the permacus is very weed free. All my gardens over the years, even when I had seven and a half acres, very weed free, but using different methods. But the, the possibility is there to, to have very few weeds. And that's what you really want to explore, particularly if you're starting out. And year one, I'll be mentioning is quite key to that because it it gives you the chance that's when you've got best chance to really kill perennial weeds perennial weeds you need to get rid of and then that opens the door to what you're seeing here a very weed free holding and potentially double cropping through the year so i'm in somerset zone eight <laughs> uh, basically uh the zonal classifications are more american actually but i'm a little bit warmer than probably most of you so Nonetheless, I think you can do a lot of double cropping. Here we're going from March to July, and you can see how in July it's suddenly quite empty, many of the beds or new plantings. And as we go to September on the left there, the garden's filled up again. <laughs> and that's because we do a lot of planting in the summer. A lot of vegetables grow in half a season. Uh, like for example, at the moment there's peas, broad beans, carrots, beetroot, cabbage, calabrese, all cropping. Uh, but within a month, they'll be finished. So what are we gonna grow next? So a lot of it's about using your space to its full potential. And as I put that on the right, some of the harvest, um, uh, you know, sorry, that's the next slide, I think actually, where I mentioned, oh, this is a harvest I just had. What I'm doing is basically only putting on compost once a year, but this is the first harvest. So this was just yesterday here actually well two days ago now the session's pre-recorded on the 3rd of june so you're watching on the 4th and we're harvesting already over winter broad beans salad that's ongoing all through the year bunch of carrots bunch of peach that was first harvest last year i'm selling them for one pound fifty to a shop and the calabrese likewise one pound fifty ahead and uh, not huge sales i think on the whole it would be more profitable csa um but i'm Sales are not bad, but you know, all of this is coming and then going quite fast. So we need to have second plantings ready. And this is where no dig really helps because you've got the fungi in there and the fungal network is helping plants to find not only nutrients, but moisture. Yeah, every time you put a plant in the ground with no dig, the roots start to team up within a, a small period of time, say a few days, with the existing fungal network and that helps them to find oh sorry wrong way moisture and these are the fungi actually i have here a lot of and i'm not too sure what their name is um, but they're you know i think different soils and locations will get probably different fruiting spores different types of mycelial network some people call them indigenous microorganisms or imos some people go to great lengths to you cultivate and bring those IMOs into their soils. Uh, I reckon with no dig, it just happens. You know, I think there's a lot of things just happen when you get it right. And there's a lot of people out there who will try and sell you products like mycorrhizal fungi, for example. I really urge you not to buy any of that stuff. You know, just go no dig and encourage your natural native soil fauna and flora to express itself because it will, it can. And you will get the native organisms by default. And that's what you want. And sometimes when we're harvesting here, like you can see around that beetroot on the right, there's a lot of white soil. <laughs> now, I think if you weren't prepared for that, you might worry. Um, but it, I have a smell and it's beautiful mushrooms and fungi. Uh, it does smell actually like field mushrooms, very pleasant smell. And basically plants grown and are healthy. Uh, sorry, but I get a hang of these buttons. Uh, this was Swedes last autumn. So uh, this was after rain, so that's when the fungal bodies appear when they fruit. Uh, but the networks are there all the time. Uh, one other thing I'd mention here is how you can see I'm, I'm taking off the low leaves of the Swedes. On a field scale, that would be less applicable. I'm, the, the things I'm doing here is partly about keeping the garden very tidy, but that's also about keeping slug numbers down. I'm not using any inputs to my system apart from compost. I do use a little bit of rock dust, but I'm still not sure how effective that is. Uh, but basically it's just compost. I'm not buying any feeds. I'm not buying any fertilizers, organic ones either. And 
no slug pellets or, or anything like that. So, you know, although sometimes the compost costs a bit of money, it's big savings in other things. And having none of this other stuff put in encourages the native fauna and flora. My other input is wood chips. And I, I'm finding them useful for paths. And I hesitated on that at the beginning because because of slugs. And, you know, if you use a lot of wood chip, you could potentially have slugs. So two centimetre, you know, maybe three when they go on there quite quickly, settle down to a couple, an inch. It's not a lot. And it's not enough to smother existing weeds. You, I, I wouldn't use them like that. But this is about feeding soil fungi. You know, so much of it's about feeding soil. When you feed the soil, in my experience, this is how I understand it anyway from what I see, well-fed soil, well-nourished and well-looked after does not feel the need to grow weeds. You know, I see weeds as a recovery mechanism. You know, if you get a lot of weeds, you, have, you need to ask yourself why. Why they're there. Yeah, nothing happens for accidentally. Nature has means and methods. And you might have heard the saying, um, chickweed follows the rotavator, for example. A lot of farmers say that. Uh, but they don't really follow it through and think, oh, if I didn't rotate, I wouldn't have so much chickweed. But obviously, then they've got to work out a way that they didn't need to rotate. But that's how you need to start thinking, going back a step and working out why things are there. Same with pests. You know, there's a reason for pests. And at the moment, there's a lot of aphids. Don't worry. <laughs> it's normal for this time of year. If you think about it, aphids have got to build up in numbers before the predators can really get established. So there's a bit of a hiatus period at the moment where there's a lot of aphids and the ladybirds, hoverflies, lace wings, whatever, are themselves now breeding fast because they've got lots of food to eat. And then rest of the summer, in a healthy environment, you'll have a, a stable situation with some aphids and some predators. So that's also about learning to set the bar and not having zero pests, but just an acceptable number that we can live with because we've got to have a certain number of um, predators. And, you know, there's always some slugs. I'm pretty slug free. I get very little slug damage. And I'm really proud of that. But I know there's always a few slugs and just keeping the garden tidy for me and weed free actually really helps. It all links in in many positive ways. But there you have my main input of the year and mostly in late autumn as beds slowly clear from the second cropping. Some stay over winter, like on the left there, there's some broccoli, overwintered purple sprouting broccoli, transplanted July after broad beans, so second crop. <clears throat> and because we've taken lower leaves off, we can spread compost underneath it. So we do manage to get most of the compost on in the autumn. Leeks on the right, that's an exception there. When they're harvested later in the winter, then we spread compost. Uh, but it all happens before, say, April. And for me, this sums up the philosophy. <laughs> In all spheres of your life, you know, the, this no-dig approach where you're, you're looking to cut out the crap, basically. You know, just <laughs> humans love to complicate things. And, and I see this like it's sourdough bread. It's become highly fashionable now. I cannot believe some of the stuff I'm reading about how you have how you have to that's the way it's phrased feed your starter and, and all this sort of thing you take it out of the fridge give it something every day now, uh, no you don't need to so all i do is keep a bit of dough each time i bake maybe once a week keep it in a yogurt pot in the fridge i didn't used to have a fridge actually and i kept it in the room that needed a bit more management but it still worked and then i um, get it out get it going that evening and i leave my dough to rise overnight bake in the morning as simple as that. that. What you're seeing there is 100% rye. No wheat of any kind. And I'm, you can see that what a nice even consistency there is, even though the rye is a low gluten flour. And that's very, very simple. And this is the spirit of what I want to fully convey. You know? and, and I would also mention, you know, don't believe too much. There's, there's a lot of nonsense out there. Like I was saying, people love to complicate their things. Always look for that core simplicity and follow your own hunches as well. If something sounds too complicated, it's probably not right. But the approach here, this was when I arrived at Homemakers, late 2012, and first thing I did was get hold of some, in this case, well rotted cow manure. That's a five ton heap on the left, delivered by a local farmer. At the time, that cost me £30, a ridiculous price. He had hardly paid his transport. But anyway, you know, find what you can. You might be surprised what's available. 
for some people, organic matter is a waste. Obviously, to us growers, it's not at all. It's quite the opposite. But, you know, it's matching supply and demand. There are possibilities. And I used that as mulch, in this case, with not much cardboard. I was experimenting with different ways of mulching then, three years later after starting in early 2013 then. And I've got a really beautiful garden. But even within one year, as you'll see, you can go pretty fast. Like here we have the other side of homemakers in late autumn 2012. So again, it's uh, slightly daunting. <laughs> and um, there's the pile of manure. And the field is quite weedy. It's looking kind of brown because I had it topped by tractor just to get it level. Level ground really helps. And then going forwards, we have a nice garden already happening. I was already selling vegetables within a few months of starting like the spinach in the foreground, for example, spring onions, lettuce, salad bags, and still a lot of mulching though. This is year one. Year one is that critical phase. There's still cooch grass in the ground here. There is still bindweed. The buttercups are on their way out, but they're still potentially there. There's still some, there's still a few dandelions. Much weakened by the mulch. So the mulching I'm using is, in this case, but there are variations on this, but I'm just showing you what I did to give you some clues and clarify the principles, which is light exclusion is the main principle. If you can smother weeds to exclude light from them, they can't grow. You know, as sure as night follows say, there are no miracles of weed growth that beat that one. Uh, it's a bit the same that you can put bindweed roots on compost heap. You know, if you keep adding things to the compost heap, those bindweed roots will eventually die. That totally contradicts most of what you'll hear and read, but it's totally true. So that's why I keep urging people to question things. So that's June. And then this is the bit about the paths. Paths get overlooked too much. Paths are important. What I'm looking to move to here, this is where a little, little bit overlaps gardening and farming. It's, it's unfortunate in the UK that we have such a dichotomy really between farming and gardening which I think is a shame and no dig is very good at bridging that gap because you know you could argue that what I'm running is a large garden or a small farm and we're on that boundary where it becomes commercial and possible to sell a worthwhile amount while maybe doing other things uh, but one way to maximize use of your space grow on as little space as you can because that's easier to manage keep it as productive as possible have quite narrow paths have beds that are as wide as possible because then you increase the proportion of bed to path. So the American method of one meter beds, which I see a lot, and or even 30 inch, I, I find that too narrow in terms of, yeah, it's easy to kind of manage and hop over and that sort of thing. Uh, but it increases the proportion of path space in the total holding area. Uh, even if your paths are, I don't know, with maybe 30 inch path, would you have a 14, 15 inch path 30 inch bed 14 15 inch path um that's debatable but in all i can say is my my preferred width of bed is 1.2 meter four feet and um, preferred width of path 14 to 15 inches that's 35 to 40 centimeter so yeah something of that order having said that you know in this picture the, the beds in front are five feet wide 1.5 meters and the paths are two feet 60 centimeters so you know that what I'm always showing gardeners in particular is, you know, that there's no absolute best. It's up to you to decide, find what works and, and fit it accordingly. But what you can really save space by not having any wooden sides. Now, the two beds in front, unfortunately, don't <laughs> convey that because they're the, my only two wooden sided beds. And that's my dig, no dig trial, dig bed on the left, no dig on the right. I have wooden sides on them just to uh, maintain their shape and for the integrity of the experiment. Basically, year one. I'm mulching the cooch grass, and I, that's the third application of cardboard on those pathways on the left. That's July. By November, the cooch grass is dead, 100% eliminated. You can get rid of cooch grass if you're thorough. Uh, in my experience, it doesn't survive beyond a year if you give it no light anywhere, and that includes bed edges, path edges, everywhere. And uh, you know, the roots have only got limited energy. Bindweed takes longer. I bindweed far left there which took me another year of repeated pulling. Uh, mare's tail if you're unlucky enough to have that one well maybe five ten years you know that's just incredible but then this this is where you're going you know you're going to a place where there's 
no bedsides, if you particularly on the left, you can see the two other beds are not in the way. Uh, paths are quite narrow, space fully cropped, almost no damage from slugs. I'll just quickly mention leather jackets here because the last previous two years we hadn't had leather jacket damage and then this spring we've had a lot and I suspect quite a few might have and it's to do with that really mild winter and they just survived and potentially they are worse in no dig but I think the other benefits of no dig outweigh that. What we did in the spring this year where plants were failing particularly lettuce, spinach and beetroot I find scoot them up with two fingers or try and find the leather jacket squash it might be too even and replant have some spare plants and that worked more or less that's all I can say really but you know if you people say cultivate to get rid of leather jackets uh, and I have the same about wire worms but the damage you do to other organisms is, is so shocking that you're not going to go forwards using that approach you know, it has to be no dig for the integrity of, of what you're doing and then subsequent weeding as well you know there's hardly any weeding going on at homemakers like at the moment my son Edward is helping me you know Typical thing for a volunteer or helper, I'm actually paying, but whatever, you know, for a new worker, unskilled labor, if you like, get them weeding. He has not done any weeding yet. He's actually doing some watering. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's like there is so little weeding. And then that's first plantings there. So the first part of the year, second crops, and all the second plantings, this is all happening in the same year, do not have any further addition of anything. The compost we put on once a year there is no follow-up needed in the summer. And this ties in with efficiency of use of time. This is really important when you're commercial cropping every second count, particularly in the summer months. So if you can do jobs like feeding the soil in the winter, that saves you time in the summer. I don't do any liquid feeding either. You know, for me, that comes from the school of fertilizer use. Why would we need to liquid feed when we've got a soil that's well, fully functioning, fully alive, is well nourished in terms of its organisms being well nourished? You know, feeding the soil is not about dolloping on nutrients. You know, if that's the case, we'll just go and use fertilizer. It's about feeding soil life, soil organisms, so that they keep it all working, busy, aerated, drained, and the store of nutrients is held in water in soluble form. A really important point this that even gets missed in a lot of organic uh, teachings. You know, they talk about covering the winter to stop leaching of nutrients. Oh, no, what? what are you talking about? You know, if, if nutrients leached in nature, the planet would be a desert by now. If, if soil is properly organized, um, nutrients do not wash away in winter rain and they're available in the spring and summer. And, you know, I do find actually, and a, quite a bit of traditional organic teaching, almost a slight obsession with nutrients and chemicals. And, and they, they, they get into talking the chemical language, even though they're organic, and, and seem to forget the biology. It's biology here that's so important. So that's why you can see that abundance in the cropping of the autumn, even though nothing has been added to the soil for almost a year. Uh, the, and, and my application of compost is going down. I'm putting on between three and five centimeters at point of application. By the time it's settled, it's two or three centimeters. Uh, that's the amount. I reckon to cover my beds, not the paths. And in fact, this was January this year. And sometimes I get groups visiting, particularly permaculture, and they'll say, oh, all this bare soil, it's not mulched. <laughs> uh, because they've been taught that mulches are things like straw and hay. And they haven't been taught that in a damp climate that encourages slugs. Uh, so I explain that and then they get it. So basically the mulches, you can see there if you look closely, the compost uh, of different colours. Some of the lighter, the lighter one you can see there actually on the right hand picture is horse manure from the hotbed I make in my greenhouse and then I keep it until the autumn. I do an amino parallel test on it by growing some tomatoes in it through the summer. And if it passes that, then I'll spread it on my beds. If it didn't pass it, huh, not too sure what I'd do. Like, well, I'll spread it on some grass and let the mycorrhizae uh, not so much mycorrhizae, it might be mycorrhizae, soil microbes break it down. In fact, you can see the, the fungal, the horse manure bed on the left there, so it gets turned. And then this was in January this year, so winter cropping, I don't think, you're not going to make your fortune on winter cropping 
but it's always good to have some vegetables to keep your customers interested uh, if you're running a CSA particularly and harvesting takes longer and longer it's not so pleasant there's various things to consider like that <laughs> it can be easier to buy and things especially field grown vegetables like potatoes don't really pay on this no dig system uh, but all of that was grown at home because um, it's possible to crop in the winter i do mostly winter salads actually and that certainly keeps all my customers keen and interested so yeah just going back to the original phase because it's so important to get this right year one if you're taking over wild and weedy areas if they're brambles or woody plants i'd take a spade to them i do dig them out you know no dig doesn't mean no spade and it's good to uh, sometimes dig things out and there's some you need a hole to plant apple trees as well you know it's like no dig is not a religion uh, it's just minimal soil disturbances basically but that's what happened after a year and a half in my front and there was a lot of bindweed that was hedge bindweed the one with the big white fleshy roots nearer the surface and now there are none there is no bindweed there so i'm you know happy with that it is possible then people wonder about soil compaction that's a very interesting word because often when the word compaction is used the soil is actually not compacted. So it's an example of where words can be very misleading. There's a lot of misleading words out there. And if, if people are talking and using words like this, just, you know, it's worth asking exactly for them to clarify, what do you mean by that? Just while I think about it, actually, I've got to mention one, one other word here, which is regenerative. Now, what does that mean? I had an email this morning from someone who wants to volunteer here, and she said, uh, I've been working on three different regenerative farms, as they call themselves, and they're all tilling the soil. They're all called plowing, rotating, whatever. You know, it's like, how can that be regenerative? Well, <laughs> I don't know. Here, though, I think most people would say you've got a soil problem. I would agree. Um, but I wouldn't call it compaction, because actually when I made a little hole in that soil, it, there wasn't any soil damage below the top, say, five centimetres, two inches. Underneath there, it was still... Fine, it had been grass. The builder had driven his machine over, uh, creating a sunroom for me, digging out the soil. Uh, on the right, by the way, is another of his machines. They were digging foundations for my greenhouse. This was my first winter here. It was filthy wet, and so there was a bit of driving around going on the ground, but it's all recovered. And this one in front here, I didn't do any cultivation to remedy that damage. I waited for it to dry out, March, April, and then I got that on the left. I leveled it off, that's all, using a spade, a spade and a rake, got it level, scattered grass seed, one centimetre, half inch compost, which was green waste as it happens, and I got some grass and a few flowers I made of border. So I want to encourage you, you know, to, to believe in, in soil and what it can do for itself if we don't mess it too much, help it where appropriate. And the word compaction, be careful of that one. There aren't many truly compacted soils. Soil can be hard especially when it's dry, it's very hard at the moment. That doesn't mean it's compacted. Loose, fluffy soil is not what you want. It's not where we're going. It's not natural for roots. Plant a plant in loose, fluffy soil, it will fall over. Yeah, that, that's not the way to go. So, rotavators, forget it. Cooch grass, you can get rid of it by mulching. So that, my greenhouse had a lot of cooch there. Like you can see on the left, that was a turf the builder dug up making the trench for the brick wall. I hope that, <laughs> yeah. And then um, on top, cardboard, thick cardboard, that was so nice, thick card with a bit of soil and compass on top. Actually, 20 centimetres up and on there because it was greenhouse and lovely fine crops through the summer. But the couch grass, you know, it's, it's, you've always got to be on it. Don't underestimate it. Edges. Edges is always where it will come in, like the overlap. If it was, if on the right there, if that overlap had had compost on top, the cooch would not have made it to the top. It already weakened to get to that point. But um, using cardboard, do make sure your overlaps are good. On that bed there, I'm not actually using any cardboard, the one on the left here. So that's because I basically I'd run out of cardboard. <laughs> this was my first spring at home because late winter and uh, we were making a lot of beds and scrounging cardboard uh, Steph my partner was very good at that she would arrive at the house um, she lives in Bruton and, and fill up with fresh cardboard 
we detape it all. Anyway, so I'm killing the pathway weeds with the cardboard and the bed weeds, 15 centimeter compost. Some of the weeds push through like buttercup. So I was weeding the beds. I did a lot more weeding in year one than subsequently. Year one is, is quite difficult, you know, compared to where you're going in the end. So that's when you've got to really apply yourself and have all the resources you need ready, hopefully. Uh, and you'll spend more on compost in year one than you will subsequently by some considerable margin. So these amounts of compost I'm putting on here is a lot, you know, it might be as much as 12, 15 tons, you can see in that photograph. But that's setting me up for many years ahead. And I'm, I'm putting on one sixth of that in, in subsequent years, but every year. And for me, the, for the amount I'm selling, you know, that just seems such a reasonable input. And there's nothing else going in here. This is first crops 2017. And again, half season vegetables, broad beans that were sown in November, lettuce that was sown in March, or February planted March, and potatoes and so on. And everything by September is different. And all of that's growing without any added compost. So it's succeeding with succession. Make sure you do your propagation at the best times. And then you can enjoy the winter. <laughs> that was the cold spring March two years ago. This photo is particularly interesting. So if you look at the date, you can see it's just two days before the equinox and the sunlight is already quite strong then. You know, there's winter and there's winter. And really, that, this is spring. Look at the difference after just six hours. The snow is suddenly gone. Temperature is lifted, obviously. But it's the light that's interesting. And for a grower, light is as important as warmth. You know, it's why I think there's too much emphasis paid to warmth and heating polytunnels in the winter is something I'm often asked about. You know, just don't go there. It's such a waste of time and money. Uh, because unless you're going to add light as well, and it's, it's just not worth it. But by the time you've added warmth and light, wow, <laughs> that's a huge investment for really not much return. But in the spring, you've got a lot of free light that's not often being used by plants because it's too cold. Like now, you know, like the, this time of year that you're seeing here. So that's where fleece comes into its own. And I use a lot of fleece covers in the early spring. Everything we transplant, starting in the middle of February, actually, with Wild Rocket, which was in September we cover systematically with fleece and that not only converts light to warmth, light which is otherwise wasted. So yes, you lose a bit of light with fleece, but you gain a lot of warmth. The net equation is very positive. So your plants grow more strongly and also they're protected from pigeons, uh, rabbits, whatever larger pests you might have. Not too many insect worries at that time of year. Um, slugs you've obviously got to be careful about, but if you, with a system like this, you should be starting spring with very low slug populations. There is minimal slug habitat there. That's what the slug issue is all about. And it's the whole organic attitude to pests. It's about being aware of pest habitats and how they breed and develop and timings and not going there, not making it possible for them to flourish. So it's sorting the problem before it happens, not firefighting a problem once it arrives. Life is a lot easier like that. In April, we know that it's going to freeze. So you're only planting frost hardy plants. It's surprising how many vegetables are frost hardy. Obviously, all the ones you can see here, like broad beans, completely keeled over by this frost. It was at minus three. The purple sprouting broccoli in the middle there doesn't look good at that point. But within six hours again, they were fine. So everything transplanted at this time is frost hardy. And this was so illustrated this year on May the 12th when we had, we had minus two here, I'm sure many of you had a frost. It was so widespread. In fact, a local grower here grows 40 acres of cider apples. He'd lost his whole crop in that frost because the warmth had brought them on. That was beyond his control, but vegetables is within our control. Don't sow the frost tender vegetables too early. Like mid-April under cover is plenty early enough for courgettes, but there's nothing still, nothing planted out, even by this stage, May the 3rd, that's frost tender. Everything you see here is frost hardy. And we kept the covers on until this point, late April, early May. And then they come off, left-hand photograph. And we get fast growth then, as 
it warms up. And because you brought plants on early, your seedlings can benefit from the amazing light available in May. May is such a key month. But if you're only putting in tiny seedlings in May or sowing seeds in worse in May, you lose the benefit of that potential growing time. And then with successful spring growth, you've got harvest early, then you can replant. Even after harvest like onions, they were multi and onions went in spring, harvest August and replanted with salads. So salads, I feel for small growers is a strong way to grow because of the economic potential of them. And the photograph on the right, that is one whole year since any application was made to the soil, no compost. These methods have been adopted. Um, they are being adopted more and more across the world, actually. I'm really excited, uh, partly through my videos and teachings. These guys from Luxembourg came on a course here four years ago, and they've just gone for it. They've got uh, three acres, I think, now, no dig. They're an example of a larger scale operation. Um, three three full-time people and the internal volunteer <coughs> running three acres don't quote me on those figures precisely but they've got a um instagram page quite like do check it out and um, you know they, they'd probably love to hear from me as well if you direct message them they're really nice men in their early 30s and make a go of a csa but what i would say this this guy also he worked here in 2016 he he his sales there was from as little as a quarter of an acre but with quite a big greenhouse and those figures, that figure there, the 1,060 euros, you know, that's Germany. <clears throat> they got more money, and, uh, and it's a big difference. In the UK, I feel that we're massively handicapped by the perception that vegetables need to be cheap. And I, I, I struggle to sell vegetables for what I consider a realistic price. And CSA shares, I think, are not fully valued to what they're worth. But you can't beat market price, so we're kind of stuffed with that market price in the UK anyway. Um, we can have a premium, but it's, if it's a premium on a low price, it's still not brilliant. But in Germany, they're managing much better and small scale growers, they're doing all right. And then I got this one even last December, I was so amused and pleased as this guy created a no dig garden from scratch, just he said by watching my videos and he's, he's looking to teach people now in Southern India, um, with this method, he's, he's still working on finding inputs and he was using millets for all that. Obviously that's what they got a lot of and it works in his climate. You know, this is so much about what it is. The, the, the precise details will vary according to your situation, but the methods, the principles are the same. And then I'm also doing scale downs like this one. So, because I want to encourage small gardens, you know, I see feeding the planet. It's not only going to be about growers and farmers doing it. It's about millions of people doing it small amounts of ground but productively and this one is giving a large yield 25 square meters and just to the right is the the one bed that i featured in videos um we'll see that in a minute then here's more time saving tips you know with growing our well, gardening everything really time saving so key and traditional gardening literature has so much about holding off it's so formulaic you know, that, that's how they, these things are taught, it's formula. Uh, you need to cut through all that and just understand why and then find a shortcut. And with use of fluce, you don't need to harden off, basically, it's as simple as that. So we just take things straight out of the greenhouse. I've even taken vegetables like pea plants off the hotbed, you know, they're 35 centigrade in the model, put them in cold soil, and cover over, they're fine. The plants are hardier than they're given credit for. And then you get this amazing transformation. On the right, it's minus three degrees. On the left in that one, it's just 16 days later. And then one month after that, fantastic growth in the spring. But from getting started early, <coughs> using the fleece, understanding things like not needing to harden off, just cracking on. This is a quick flashback to my first market garden. And it'll give you an idea of how I was running it in a different way then, using straw mulch and the pathways. And that's because my brother was farming at the time and he kept giving me straw, basically. It's not organic straw. Um, I was sold association registered, that was allowed in those days. And I was not cropping so intensively, do more field scale be survival now. The prices were relatively higher there. And 
you can see the straw much in the pathway, but I was using not much compost, uh, around half inch per bed um, per year, really just a light dusting. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's different ways of doing the digger managing the fertility. We were selling to supermarkets. I got my fingers badly burnt doing that, then started market stores and boxes. And if I was growing on this scale now, I'd definitely be looking for CSA. And that seems to me the way to go. Uh, there was quite a nice large greenhouse I bought in the late 80s. I bought it for £600 and it cost about 2500 to put it up. And I was trialling other ways, you know, even rotating, dare I say it, and then mulching with paper because always. <laughs> and uh, in the end, not that impressed with so many issues arising from that, including, you know, the inputs. This was my previous garden to here, which is lower farm, and I was cropping an acre. And from that, I was selling around £30,000. This was the soil at Homemakers, and very interesting because at Homemakers, I'm on silt, dense soil. This was clay, dense soil again. No dig works on any soil, I reckon. My first garden was Cotswold brush, stony, and this, as you can see, clay. And I was curious to see if this was after years no dig what it looked like at the point. And uh, there you can see the <clears throat> not only the one, but if you look closely at that photograph, there's a lot of little red holes. That is a very um, active, busy soil with very good aeration drainage. It's kind of ironic because of the way it's been taught about digging or even double digging, it's to improve drainage. <laughs> it's actually the opposite. It's worsening drainage in, in my experience. You know, I, I hesitate to say that. Over the years, I've hesitated to say that. I don't like contradicting established opinion, but I think... <laughs> I just don't agree with that statement. It's just not right. It's not borne out by what I'm seeing and noticing. So again, this is clay soil. You don't really see it because it's covered in mulching. This was 2007 is when I really got on with <coughs> trialing cardboard and compost method. Worked really well to get rid of grass by the cup, dandelion. And that small area I also trialed intercropping with apple trees. I would recommend using M9 rootstock if you're going to do something like that. You don't want a tree that's too greedy for moisture in the summer. It doesn't want to be too big. This was looking up the other way at Lower Farm. So this is the clay saw. I've got my beds running up and down a slope. If you have a slope, again, this contradicts a lot of traditional advice. But traditional advice is nearly always based on an unstated assumption. This is what you must recall when you hear things. The unstated assumption in this case is that soil is being tilled because that's what most people do. So it's always advised that you run beds across the slope, not up and down. Because if you have plowed, rotated, harrowed, whatever, your soil on top is loose and crumbly, heavy rain will wash it downhill. With no dig, that does not happen. Therefore, what I noticed there was my the field of brother, you can just see the top of in that photograph. My brother ploughed it every autumn to grow his wheat, organic wheat. And then we got what's happening on the left there after the ploughing, terrible drainage on his field, and it all ran through mine. But it just trickled down the pathways, it didn't flood me out, and the water could disperse. And if I'd run the beds across, it probably might have blocked the water and at risk a bit of an avalanche of soil coming down or what i don't know for sure but all i can say is up and down on a slope works really well if you're on a really steep slope maybe more than 10 degrees you know very rough approximate figure you might need to consider some kind of terracing um, and virtual growing won't be so easy it's possible um, this was quite steep enough and and it was very possible and viable um, there it is again on the left <coughs> on the right was a more level part of lower farm um, and you can see the figure at the top there is roughly an acre for that amount of output. And again, very little weeding time needed. That was me full time running this and one person part time, mainly for picking. You know, picking is so much the big job. And this is then going to homemakers in 13, excuse me, where the um, so I was starting with blank canvas of weeds. <laughs> I left all the weeds there in place. And I was showing this actually to a National Trust head gardener in the first spring. And he, he said, Charles, let me just clarify one thing. 
the first thing you did was remove the toes. You know, and I found that such an interesting question because I had never said that. I never removed toes. You know, I never said to this guy, I removed the toes. He assumed it. It goes back to the thing of, you know, assumptions and getting clear on how things work and what you need to do and what you don't need to do. There's a lot of assumptions made about that you need to do a certain number of things that actually you don't need to do. Rotation is another one that I'm going to mention. That will come in a minute. But here I was trialing polythene munches, among other things. And a little bit of green manures. I don't tend to use green manures very much because I want to grow vegetables. <laughs> yeah, green manures is, is not economic in my view. It's cheaper to buy a bit of extra compost and double crop. There's an argument to be had there for both ways, but green manures suggest you're cropping a larger area more than you need to crop. And that is more management, more time, more cost. And economic viability, compost, and it also means that green manures like that mustard on the right there, I've noticed that's killed by frost, that's why I use it, white mustard. And I find that it leaves a residue of slugs, which compost melts on its own does not. So I'm cropping most of the autumn. First year I wasn't so much. And then going forwards, you can see also the no dig asparagus bed getting established very quickly by year three. You know, that again is so much simpler than the traditional way of digging a trench or whatever it might be. Asparagus no dig is very viable. The key advice I'd give to you if you're looking at doing it is invest wisely and heavily maybe in getting good crowns. You know, they are so, or, or sowing good seed. It must be F1 hybrids, so all male to be viable. Um, but don't skimp on that. Get your ground clean before you plant. I mean, that's where sowing seed actually can be viable. Sow it in the spring while you're mulching the ground and then transplant the asparagus even the following spring as one year old. Obviously, there's quite a lot of time waiting, um, but it, it's, it's a viable crop, no dig, uh, because the maintenance is so light once you've got it going. Hardly any weeding. And there's none of this business of trenching and ridging and all that stuff, really. <laughs> where does that come from? Um, comes from... Victorian gardens where they had too much labour, in my opinion, and needed jobs for them, like <laughs> unnecessary weeding. And then what we do in the autumn is cut down this progress when it goes yellow a bit. And I've taken to put it in the path actually between the two beds. Now, not clean, there's no problems. Like we've got asparagus beetle here, that can be an issue. Now, we just about keep on top of that by squashing them, um, but it's not too serious. This is uh, planting some fruit trees. Let's pop this into no dig variation. Um, making a very small hole. You can see on the right, well, both pictures, the holes are just the size of the root ball. You don't need to loosen the soil any more than that. One year maidens, that has to be the way to go. They're the cheapest, simplest, and quickest to plant. And then they establish quite quickly. You're starting from a little stick, and before you know it, you've got a little tree, but you must mulch around them. <clears throat> I haven't got time to go into that in detail, but you can glean a few of the principles there. And then uh, I was cropping some vegetables under the trees in years one and two, but by year three, it's flowers mainly for <coughs> my enjoyment and hopefully attract some predators. And then smallest tree rootstock on the left there and small plum on the right. Just a quick summary, a recap of perennial weeds getting rid of them. It's that principle of year one, doing everything it takes, thorough marching, light exclusion, Compost is not only about smothering weeds in year one, it's about feeding soil organisms, soil life, and in the case here in particular, I was using polythene. If you use polythene, you have to adapt your cropping. You can't sow carrots through polythene, obviously. I made a few holes and planted some squash. You know, that's a, a very nice year one crop if you've got a lot of weeds and you want to use polythene. Potatoes is another option for that. Peel back the polythene. Most weeds are dead. Find weeds still alive. No surprise. Remove it with a trial, what you can see. Uh, there's an example of bindweed still growing under carpet. And <laughs> the um, that's wool carpet. If you want to use carpet and, and leave it in place particularly, but even so, I really don't recommend modern carpet with fibres. And there I'm moving the bindweed with a trowel. I use copper tools mostly. I can't get a parent root, but I can remove enough to slow 
the wide way down, same with couch grass, this is year one mostly. And then what do I do with those roots? They go on the compost heap. So this was year one. Compost is all, uh, it had a lot of perennial weed roots and by October there, there were none, you know. But if you worry that about it and that there might be some there, you'll see them when you spread the compost, you can remove them. And yeah, they're vigorous. <laughs> this was my son, Albert, and he, holding um, that amazing bindweed root. That came out with just by pulling somehow. And there he is, videos. He's been big help with the YouTube channel. Um, so that's a lot about perennial weeds, annual weeds. There's less to say really, but sometimes there's much to do. It's repeat process every spring, basically. You know, the new weeds that come in with compost or that fly in with the wind or a drop by birds. So I guess that's the three main points of entry. What you can see on the left there, if you look closely, is little seedlings and their fat hand. And that's pretty typical weed from cow manure. So I'm just running my hoe blade through. That's a really nice hoe, by the way. It's a swivel oscillating hoe. Uh, copper bladed, costs about £100. But you know, what an investment. That's a tool for life. And the time a good hoe can save you, find a hoe that works best for you. Once you get familiar with it, you just pick it up and it's like an extension of your own. You can whiz around very fast. And weed strike is the term. You're cutting hoeing your weeds when they're very small. Weed strike means dislodging weed seedlings when they're barely visible. It's quite a nice old saying, which is hoe your weeds before you see them, which is not literally true. You're going out in March, though, looking. You're looking for the weeds. It's not the other way around. It's not like you go out and, oh, my God, the weeds, they're all waving at you. You know, you've got to be on the front foot with weeds. I've learned the hard way. I know exactly what it's like if weeds get ahead of me, and that's why. Some people feel I'm maybe a bit neurotic about weeds, but I, I have a very good reason for being that. Weeds, weeds don't hang around. So with this approach, though, you can stay on the front foot, and that's where you want to be. If you can't hoe, if it's too wet, <coughs> pull the weed seedlings. That's quicker than letting them grow and having big weeds to deal with. So you are tuning your eyes and attitude to this size of weed that you need to deal with. But even now, when I'm walking around my garden doing other jobs, if I see weed seedlings like this, I'll stop, I'll kneel down, pull them out, job done. Weeds are good at kind of hiding themselves, going incognito, disguise, and then before you know it, you've got a big one dropping seeds. So that's why I will pull them when I see them. Okay, potatoes. The old fashioned Irish lazy bed using compost. Lazy bed's a nice method, it's not no dig, but it's folding upside down toes from each side onto the seed potato which just sits on the ground more or less anyway that's one idea here i'm doing similar we had mulched this ground with a bit of old hay previous november then i'm putting oh, 10 15 centimeter uh and then a bit of the old hay on top basically that was it come back at harvest time this is ground that had been weedy previous november the pasture what I like about this photo is it shows the principle of what's going on. You can see the fine little white roots of the potato plant going down into the soil below. Then you can see the tubers in the surface compost above. See how clean they are too. <coughs> to the question I'm often asked, how do you dig no dig potatoes? Well, it's the question that's not right. It's how do you harvest no dig potatoes? You pull them. So you get your hand around all the stem and pull. There are some nestling in the ground like you can see there. Either use finger and thumb or use a trowel just to make sure you've got all the ones a bit lower down. But if the soil is no dig, it's firmer. The potatoes have not gone down into it so much, they're more rising up. That does mean sometimes you might need to drop extra compost on at this time of year if your potatoes are becoming visible and going green. Yeah, there's a bit to learn about no dig potatoes, but it's entirely possible. And it's not true, in my opinion, that potatoes break up the soil. Maybe their roots do a little bit, but it's most of, in that phrase, most of the soil breaking up is done by the farmer or gardener, you know, with the tilling, rosemary, plowing, whatever. Um, and you can see how parsnips, carrots, you know, they don't need loose, fluffy soil to go down. This is clay soil, compost mulch on top. I find germination is parsnips, you know, that often people struggle with. I've noticed they're much better in no dig. I think because moisture is retained more in the spring, that key time when the seeds are germinating. And this is what I do to help with that germination. And a lot of gardeners, when they see this, they throw their hands up in horror. 
you walk on your bed? Because <laughs> they have been taught endlessly. You must never walk on your bed. I get another example of a false statement with an assumption. The assumption that the soul has been dug loosened. Therefore, if you walk on the soul, it collapses again. <laughs> you know, well, you, one step forward and two back, basically. Whereas here, the soul is firm all the time. <clears throat> I've drawn the carrot drill in the surface compost mostly. They're going in towards the soil level. It's all mixed up anyway by worms. And then it was a dry match. And I didn't water this one, actually. They came up. This year I did water about the 30th of March <clears throat> after one week to help ensure good germination. Because um, these photos are now of last year. That's how we can suddenly get to the middle of June on the left hand photograph. And I'm transplanting Brussels sprouts actually in the carrot bed. You can see how lovely the carrots are with no dig. They go down really well. And they also pull out mostly pretty nicely as long as the ground is not too dry. And I'm transplanting, you know, this sort of some of you do even know that you can do the interstowing, interplanting so much more easily and quickly, uh, get a second crop without having to wait for the first one to finish. We'll see that more in a minute. Just gonna whiz through the trial beds. Uh, this was Lower Farm. I started trialing, comparing Dig No Dig in 2007. I got six years of results. These are all on my website, so I won't leave it here too long. This was creating the current Dig No Dig comparison beds at Homemakers 2012. We just posted a video of these actually as they were on May 31st this year. And this was <clears throat> 2019, so last year. You can see the potatoes just laid out on top there prior to planting. I do four rows, four in a row, two rows across. Same plantings in the same beds. Harvest equal number of plants at the same time. See what we get. And double cropping, so that's the second plantings in September. By which time the soil, the dig soil has recovered somewhat, <laughs> it suffers in the spring. The, um, there's results of trials. Quite a big difference. So statisticians who look at this, some of them say that's significant, some disagree and say it's not. I think it's significant. <laughs> I mean, for me, what's significant is the reduced amount of weeding. And think, you know, little things like, in a wet year, the potatoes come out much cleaner from no all root vegetables. Watering is much easier when you've got the surface mulch undisturbed soil. Water soaks in better drainage than where you've got dug soil capping on top after heavy rain or high water. This was a microscopic evaluation of the two beds where the <coughs> lady who does this in Norway has done quite a few and she pointed out what's going on which is in the dig bed soil on the left. There are many particles much smaller in size compared to on the right. We have what's called soil aggregation of particles. So also you've got the same amount of stuff there, but in the no dig it's grouped together in little clusters. And how does it hold together? Well, partly because it hasn't been disturbed by cultivation. But I would say that's soil's natural method, if you like, of holding itself together, not washing away in rain allowing roots to pass through and the mechanism seems to be you know scientists are still discovering these things but to do with mycorrhizal fungi mycorrhizal fungi have an outer, outer sheath called glomalin glue-like substance only discovered 25 years ago and as the mycorrhizal filaments grow they extend and they leave behind their sheath the glomalin which is the glue which is then somehow used by other soil particles to hold soul together you know this i'm sure that this is a very <laughs> a very basic explanation and maybe wrong in certain ways but it's fitting what we know to what's going on in that picture and and what grows basically you know here we have a, a, a gardener of of 60 years jim mccall sadly now just retired he was running the beech grove gardens in scotland bbc and they decided they'd heard about no they thought, well, let's give it a go in our gardens. They were sceptical. And lo and behold, you know, blown away. Look at those results in each photograph. They've got dig on the left, no dig on the right. And Jim was just saying how he's completely reevaluating his life experience. This was RHS at Wisley 2018. They're going for it. 
they're making a new garden next year actually God, i hope the garden's going to be open to visit and Kew Gardens as well all their trial beds now for the students <clears throat> every student at Kew now so the master gardeners of the future they're all learning no do so here's one of these big advantages the the double cropping potential is unlocked a lot by making more use of summer to get one crop going while the previous one is finishing you haven't got to prepare the ground you haven't got weeding weed burdens to worry about while you're getting say carrots going from a sowing between something or radishes between something whatever it might be at whichever time of year you don't need clean ground to make your next sowing or planting this is only small scale but it just illustrates the point so nicely <clears throat> august 10th very good time to sow spinach i'm not sowing spinach at the moment it goes to seed if you sow it in the spring early summer so you sow it early august you get small plants by october smaller than normal there because they're growing under tomatoes but those plants then we cut out the tomato plants at ground level leave their roots in that's one of the kind of axioms of no dig if you like when you're clearing plants you could leave roots in or twist them out whichever is appropriate and then you've got everything in place for the next crop to grow on and we cropped a lot of spinach leaves off that yeah the, the ground was always growing something always covered soil never needs a rest that's another assumption that's made soil microbes like plant roots to be there busy it's it's a living organism that needs constant nourishment and feeding and we can help the soil to do that with our vegetables yeah you could argue this is like using vegetables like green manures in some ways you you could use a green manure or in that case maybe a mustard or mizuna as a sort of semi-mustard and if you need it for cropping great harvest summer if you don't well it's gonna drop back into your ground this is uh, midsummer and i didn't think this would work to be honest but i thought well i'll give it a go because when i planted those transplanted the beetroot and chicory so there was really so little room between the onions and anyway i, I did the hole i wouldn't do it as useful made a little round hole popped in the plug plant and yeah basically those plants got established establishing plants don't need a lot of light moisture they like older plants around them and foresters are finding this out with the microbiotic the fungal network in forests how the older trees help the younger trees it's not competition you know so much of our language in farming has come from capitalism uh, it's more about anarchism and cooperation that's what's going on in soil and they cooperate and help each other oh here's another brilliant example is fennel you know how often am i ask oh everybody's telling me fennel doesn't like other plants you know where does this come from it's just not true <laughs> so you can see there how the fennel <coughs> interplant is loving being there and getting going with spinach lettuce then twisted out then the fennel finishes in november and the spinach is left to grow in the space this little bed i did this last year it's a very small scale example but illustrates that same point again with already in the left hand photograph there i've interplanted fennel late march between spinach which had overwintered if we just look at the middle section you'll see the sequence in turn then <clears throat> by late may the fennel's coming ready to harvest there's already the next planting the french beans then by august the french beans are cropping and i've already popped in some radish plants for winter radish which you can see in the fourth photograph in october on the right in the middle section everything else is changing as well it's in succession one after another it's just that middle section that i was using there to illustrate the point of keep cropping and during all that time no feeds no fertilizer no compost you know just the ground's natural replenishment happening that bed by the way all it had the previous october for compost was less than uh, two centimeters i would say at the most uh, but it was a really good one it's from delford I'll give them a shameless plug. I'm not affiliated to them anyway, um, but I do really like their compost. So I know they're expensive, but it, you get what you pay for with compost and wool compost, really good. Obviously your own compost is the best. I rate mine the best, but there comes a point where you haven't got enough usually. Uh, this is the Brussels sprouts between the carrots. And you can see how as, as the Brussels start to establish, we harvest more and more carrots around them until July. And the nice thing about this too is the double use of the mesh. So the mesh is keeping carrot root fly off, it's also keeping insects off the new Brussels sprout plants. And later I used Bacillus thuringiensis spray to keep caterpillars off, but 
it's quite easy way to grow Brussels sprouts all being well. A year like this could be challenging. If we don't get rain soon, we're going to be doing even more to, um, if we're going to maintain this intensity of cropping. But that's another story, really. Hope it won't be that. <laughs> Hope it rains. This is my three strip trial where I'm comparing forking salt with no forking and different compost as well, putting on about that much compost once a year. And that's November when we start to put on the annual application of compost. So it's cropping right the way through the second crops again. And there's the results. Again, I won't spend too long on this one because they're on my website, three strip trial. You can see all of these details. The nub of it, the sum of it for me has been showing how forking does not increase yield. <clears throat> just no dig means no broad forking either. You just don't need to do it. And it's interesting about rotation. I, this I fell into by accident, really, but I keep going with the same plantings on the same beds just to see. That was fifth year of cabbage in the same ground. Actually, the highest yield of the five in year five. I will leave you with that. And here I'm trialing four compost, different ones. So this was just a small trial to see, and this is where the Dale foot did really well. And yeah, <laughs> the green waste compost, it's not as bad as some people make out to be. If you let it age, it can give you some decent results. Um, Melcourt, they've got work to do, I think, on some of their compost. Their stable manure, as they called it, had too much bedding, which I think was um, biodigester waste. <clears throat> so, butterflies, insects, pests, basically you need to do your homework and make sure you're armed accordingly. You know, mesh is so useful. I systematically use mesh on all my summer plantings and the bacillus syringiensis for follow-up on larger plants. Polytunnel no dig. So again, surface mulching, this is the old-fashioned way of polytunnel. I, I like it. I, had to move away from it because it's getting quite hard to buy polytunnel with burying the trench but it does mean you've got a good barrier against weeds and pests coming in and i mulch with cardboard compost home story as in the rest of the garden and i'm making sure i've always got module trays of plants ready for cropping in polytunnel in the garden that's my total mod propagation area at home because it's not big because i'm planting small like those transplants on the left they've already been in the ground a week you know they they start life pretty tiny and then there's walking on the bed even just to make sure it's firm cropping right through the winter in a polytunnel like i say don't heat the polytunnel just harvest the absolute leaves keep the same plants going so i'm never cutting these plants the only cut is to winter purslane sometimes salad rocket but i don't grow that in the winter it doesn't crop very well in winter weather and we intercrop with garlic there it's a free crop we're not giving it any extra space around the cellars and then it it'll soon be harvested now because we can plant the tomatoes cucumbers on either side of it before it comes to harvest and put the compost on once a year in the polytunnels so maybe six centimeter just over two inches <clears throat> a good dressing of compost which are very homemade sometimes horse manure pre-tested for amino pyrolid and um, I like to vary it and then the double cropping. So I'm not feeding the tomatoes at all. That's the garlic harvest 12th of June, any day now actually. Bearing the string under the root ball. So that's my method for anchoring the bottom end of the support. It's tied at the top to the wires. Aubergines on the left have a double string. You can grow two stems of aubergine successfully. You could still do that now actually, uh, just uh, if you bury two strings, I could tie one to the stem. Oh, apologies for that picture on the right. I'd forgotten that was in there, actually. <laughs> I couldn't resist it, though. Uh, but you can see how the aubergines grow up very successfully on the left hand there with the two strings. That was just the very final picture in October, variety called Black Pearl. And so all this happening without any feeding. Even a crop, not a brilliant crop, but a worthwhile crop of French beans between the cucumbers underneath there. And, Intercropping with French marigolds, it's, um, people ask, does that deter aphids? You know, it, for me, companion planting does not work like that. It's not like you, you plant X to prevent Y. It's about improving the overall habitat, <coughs> giving pest and predator more chance to achieve a balance, and you will get some sort of result that's good. But you won't, 
you won't get zero if it's you know that's not where you're trying to go you'll get a very pleasant result they're lovely to look at a few aphids everything's manageable and more fun this was uh, may last year when at a crazy time yeah, we put up this new poly tunnel from first tunnels um i'll give them a plug too because I, I think they're brilliant they lovely uh, strong two inch hoops you can see there five centimeter if you're on a windy site i would back that one to survive we're pretty breezy here but not like hilltop <clears throat> and it means you can crop more to the side obviously with again no repeat feeding and you can see that's just a few days after planting on the left actually one week after planting so you can see how small the plants are going in and then on the right after one pick this is november last year and so the picture on the right is how i like my salad plants to look by christmas pretty hard pick for the christmas market and then hopefully they grow quite slowly after that because <laughs> it's midwinter that gives us a rest as well uh, that's my time off picking is is late december up to say middle of january i don't mind if it's cold weather in january even have a longer break than that picking such a big job it takes longer in the winter as well it's not the nicest work compared to this time of year but about 14 kilos i put there and that this is where i'm trialing mulches um because we're into the summer cropping now this is quite a recent photograph where because of the incredible sunshine and dry weather we've had recently i'm just to see if we can keep more moisture in the ground i could be making problems for myself here though but the miscanthus grass is very light in color and if if we had a gloomy summer that would not be good because dark surface warms up more on the right there you can't really see it but i've spread seaweed as a trial also to see yeah there's lots more to find out you could do your own trials of all kinds share the knowledge it's great we'll all find out more from this polytunnel in winter i get about three and a half thousand pounds worth um, of crops and <coughs> i bulk up my winter autumn wind towers with radicos like that so in early july that was the mix for Christmas picking. Um, much slower than the summer picking that we're doing at the moment. Salad is so quick. Lettuce is so hard, quick to harvest the outer leaves. And composting, making compost. Um, you know, I've just realised I'm maybe not going to get quite to the end of this. I'll stop at 90 minutes. <laughs> uh, but I do want to show you making compost. So I'll, I'll whiz through this. This is fairly small scale you could do this on a large scale but the, those seven bays of compost will make as much as six tons of compost in a year it's possible that's their dimensions that's how much i'm putting in a brown up to half brown that was me last september this year as i put in the caption we're not making so much compost i'm a bit worried actually it's just not the amount of greenery because of the drought but in a good year, you could be doing that six weeks to fill a heap like that from a garden like I've got here with some inputs from outside, like coffee grounds and spent hops from a brewery. I'm not getting them either because of lockdown. Uh, you know, one thing leads to another and a lot of things are different now. We do turn the compost once. I find that that investment of time is repaid more than later. You get a nicer product, better compost, easier, quicker to apply. If you put polythene on at that stage, the worms arrive incredibly and it's always lovely to see. But what I've also found with putting polythene on is I get more rats because without polythene, like the local cat can come and just keep on top of them. Weasel too. We, we've, we've seen weasels killing a rat, native rat hunters. So generally I'd advise against use of polythene. Tricky one though, um, but it goes back to what I was saying. Nutrients don't leach out of heaps like this, in my opinion. With green waste, it, it can come fresh. Let it sit there for three months until it's lost its heat before you use it. That's the difference with colour. Brown colour is generally better. You've got more shows. You've got more fungi than black, which is more bacterial, or even dare I say, anaerobic. So piles of wood chip, you know, it's more brown. And on the bottom left, you can see some spent hops. But wood chips available you know ask your local tree surgeon get hold of some heaps it's a great source of fertility that's potentially out there for free and also free of potential chemical contamination 
this year, again, I'm hearing a lot about aminopyrrolid in compost. It's so depressing. This bloody stuff it can go away. And yeah, again, you know, we're having to rethink. Would you? Pretty good. All homemade compost if you could just keep all your inputs clear of it. So that's my annual input. That's roughly how much I'm using in a year. People say to me sometimes, you know, well, I couldn't do no dig because of all the compost I'd need. Actually, for me, that is not a lot of compost. That's maybe 30 tons an acre. Old fashioned traditional gardeners who were digging and double digging would easily use that much. You know, it's just, um, it's just another misunderstanding that uh, it's not you need more compost from no dig, but it's worth it as an investment to put more on in year one. This difference of year one. Look on that as a marker you're making as an initial one off investment, but it's not subsequent every year. You'd need less in the end. You actually need less in the end because you're not disturbing soil. <clears throat> you're not releasing carbon into the air as carbon dioxide. It's staying there. This is what I was saying about the green manure. The, the one I do use, if I'm going to use it, you know, if you didn't have enough compost, you could do more of this. And synapsis arbor, <laughs> in theory, killed by frost. This year it wasn't. I had to remove not all of it, but some of it. The outer leaf method for lettuce and spinach. So the, these two beds, for example, we just do picking leaves every week. And that's the harvest. Sometimes there's more than you need. The aim is always to have enough. So sometimes we're throwing salad away, but that's better than not having enough. So you, you need to decide at planting time roughly how much you can sell. That's when you decide your cropping. And then you can be cropping quite surprising amounts from quite small areas, particularly with lettuce. Lettuce is the most productive leaf salad. And then that's how I mix it in a, but either filled with rainwater or more likely from a hose. And then I shake out the excess moisture. We put leaves in bags with moisture. Um, I can't believe it that it's often recommended you have to dry your leaves before you bag them out. That's nonsense. But obviously not running water, but moisture so that leaves in the polythene bags stay dry. I have not yet found a successful alternative to polythene bags. I've been looking pretty hard. And I, I know that um, some of you listening have been working on this as well. It, I don't think at the, at the moment, you know, something good to talk about for sure, but that there's this, a viable, economically viable and practically viable alternative bag, but when there is, we can embrace it. Quick bit about ordering, and uh, well, of course, uh, this year it's a lot more, but some, a few people worry about watering in sunlight. That's another myth. You can water in sunlight. Plants don't burn, leaves don't burn. Uh, so we water just when we've got time. We don't do it every day. At the moment in this dry weather we've had, we're doing about twice a week, on average. <coughs> three or four times a week for new plantings until they're established, but twice a week for the main crops as they're going along. Things, not everything, but things like lettuce, particularly salads, and plants that are close to harvesting. So peas at the moment, we're watering, for example, broad beans. Um, we're starting to water potatoes now. When you're sowing, that's an efficient way of getting water in there. Um, I'm a great fan of overhead watering. I feel I'll find you can see what's going on recently. as it grow particularly there anyway? Uh, capillary matting, you know, because some of you have got to learn can lead to some issues. A quick overview of potential cropping and how it varies through the year. I, I love the, the sequence of change here because it's just so dramatically fast sometimes. I mean, that's just all within <clears throat> the same month, April last year, in fact. So you've got the frost at the beginning and by the end, we're heading towards summer. <laughs> that's only the 20th though. And you can see how the overwintered broad beans in particular are so successful uh, in the Welsh climate i reckon so first week november that would be my take on it from where you are here it's 10th 12th november it's fairly precise some of these dates in the autumn <clears throat> on the left there is a bit of salad which i sowed mostly early september transplant is early october so for you it might be late august transplant late september spinach so early august transplant late august just examples of dates you know these dates are really worth getting familiar with and then You've got the double cropping potential. In the case of the bed in the middle, mid-June, the broad beans are just about to finish. And then the picture on the right, that's where the cabbage are. So the cabbage is second crop. I aim to get that in the ground the same day the broad beans are cleared because every day is so precious at that time of year. 
I don't know if you've heard the saying, but one day's growing in July is worth two in August, four in September, eight in October, and half of November. So as you can see there, 18 days in July, look at the difference. Look how much growth has happened in 18 days only at that time of year. So that's where you really want to be on it with your re and plantings in July, harvest, tidying up, whatever it is, with no dig beautifully and not having to do too much weeding. And then going into the autumn, things gradually slow down. I do find that autumn's a hugely busy month. There's so many harvests to make, as well as still new plantings for winter and spring. And a lot of that comes from propagation. So I'll finish on propagation. I'm checking the time here. Yeah, I've got time for that. That's good. So propagation skills, some of you will have them. A few of you may not. I'll just show you how I do it. You know, let's just give you some examples. And some of it's pretty homegrown. Now, like the key understanding for me in, in, in late winter is that you need to provide some warmth to get seeds germinating. <laughs> Germination needs more warmth than subsequent growth does. Therefore, if you you could bring a lot of seed trays that you just seeded into your house where the ambient temperature, particularly at night, is much lower than in, say, a greenhouse, even where you've got a heat map. It's much cheaper and easier to germinate seeds in the house. Don't throw your hands up in horror because you don't need to even spread them out. You can stack trays. <coughs> Germinating seed don't need light, so you can stack 10 trays of multisome and is all in a heap for maybe a week, depending how warm your house is. And they can germinate, then you've got to keep an eye on them, then you need to give light, maybe take them out of the greenhouse where you've got warmth. But you've got them through that germinating phase, which is where quite often there can be a holdup. <clears throat> How do you provide the warmth subsequently? Most convenient and probably still cheapest is electric heat mats, like on the left. Uh, I'm trialing a hotbed, it's not easy hotbed, and I'm not claiming it's, it's viable. It's quite a lot of work and time. If you had free horse manure, it's worth looking at. It's basically like a giant compost heap in the greenhouse. It needs to be fresh horse manure and straw. The straw is important. You, if it was literally 100% horse food, it doesn't work. And then the pallet on top to pick up that heat before it escapes from the glass. This does not heat the greenhouse much. It's to catch the heat before it escapes. Uh, but you do get, you could just a bit of the right steam at, at, when the manure is free. Just one little thing to bear in mind. But mostly it's working pretty seamlessly. And the picture on the right gives you an idea of the size of plants I'm transplanting. So I'm using, in my case, the little trays you can see there are 60s. I know that they're, they're more garden size than commercial size, which might be 84s. <clears throat> I find them really efficient and I'm getting company called container wise i'm actually investing myself in a tooling kit to make more of these because i think they have big potential there uh, they have a very small module the module size is smaller than a lot of currents current modules or cells which means you need less compost you're putting in a smaller plant it's quicker you need less propagating space and you can turn over your seedlings very fast within quite a small propagating area um, here is the Final difference towards the end of the season, you're raising large plants because these are frost tender plants, which you, we're waiting to plant them out until it's warm enough, which in our case is mid May, last frost day. This year, the last frost day was May the 15th. It was pretty accurate, and there aren't many years when that last frost day does not happen. What the Europeans call the ice saints, November the 11th to 13th, believe it or not, that was pretty much spot on this year. Yeah, November the 12th was our hardest frost almost of the winter, actually. <clears throat> minus two here. We did have a minus five earlier on, but it, it was a shocker. So don't go gung-ho, even if April is warm. <laughs> Remember those dates and middle of May. I would say definitely in Wales, central Wales probably could be 25th of May or something, but local knowledge will tell you, respect those dates, then you can go for it. I moved the horse from there from the hotbed outside and use it at what I call a warm bed. There's still warmth there, not excessive. And we put six inches, 15 centimeter compost on top plant overshoots. 
which is also actually a mean of parallel test. Checking there's no weak in there. And then this is raising plants again, having plants ready at the right time means those are cheeky curry squash. Maybe in Wales, I don't know if this will be possible, but in a warm summer here, we can get them off the ground by the end of August and plant spinach. So, you know, squash is not just a one season crop, it can be followed by summer. I'm always looking at those potentials to make the most of a small area. So I'm doing either single sowing or multi sowing and single sowing works best for some vegetables, multi sowing best for others. Like French beans, Swedes, I find grow best as singles. Uh, it's partly about harvesting, you know, how, how you pick the leaves um, or just whether you want a decent sized root like the celeriac there. Or if you want large leaves of kale, then a single plant is just easier to keep picking, for example. Whereas peas actually germinate and grow quite happily in little clumps and they can go in the ground as clumps of three and I find on average is good or if it's for shoots it could be as many as five so some of the five seeds there are for shoots. Uh, for most root vegetables I find that four is a good number to aim for that's in seedlings which means sometimes you need a few more seeds than that you know it depends on germination rate and how beetroot cluster for example <clears throat> so you need to do a bit of trial and error on that but if you can get four in a clump ultimately so I put six or seven seeds of onions, beetroot four. The four beetroot seeds allows for non-germination of some and double or triple germination of others. And we do some thinning. I don't want more than five and I aim for four. And then that's the transplanting of the onions and very high yield, better result than from onion sets in terms of storage as well. And for spring onions, very dense sowing and dense planting. <clears throat> you can see some multi sown leeks there as well. Uh, but one small area of spring onions like that gave many, many kilos. You know, this is where small is beautiful. Uh, you don't need huge acreages. If you can manage it tightly, I find it really quite impressive how much we can get. There's another fact here, actually, which is in multi sown leeks, <clears throat> I did have a give a slideshow with them. Um, Oh, his name escaped me. <laughs> uh, Canadian grower, uh, Jean Martin Fortier. And he was saying in Canada, people would not accept a leak like that. They wouldn't buy it uh, because they got used to long white shanks. If your customers are happy with a leak like that, you don't need to plant leaks deeply. They're easier, quicker to plant, easier to harvest. Multi sowing is very viable and it means you've got a slightly bent stem, um, but you, it's all edible anyway, it's just not totally white. So. Many factors there. And just to finish on propagation, where I'll also finish the slideshow. Um, using compost, you know, which compost to use, it doesn't have to be a special seed compost. The one on the right there is actually well rooted camenia, grew very nice plants. What you want to avoid is too much wood in the compost, and that's where peat free compost would really fall down, some of them. I'm, I'm amazed how much rubbish compost is sold. You know, compost companies, as far as I can see, do not test their compost before they sell it. They rely on a lab reading a lab report and uh, those lab reports are not about available nutrients. This is why I'm suspicious of soil tests. Let your plants do your soil tests. But look at the result there of using compost that was basically predominantly wood. In the sack it said organic manure. It was actually green waste compost with wood. So the wood is breaking down, robbing nitrogen from the potential growing of the plant. The compost that did best there was homemade compost, which in picture top right is not quite so big at that stage, but by the end of the trial, after three months, the homemade compost doing really well. That thing about long-term nutrient availability. And then seed. Um, well, I'll finish on these two because it's a topic that we could explore further in the question and answer session. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Um, if you want to learn more in depth, you may know already, but I do run online courses. They're available from my website. And I'm looking forward to discussing with you next week. Thanks very much, Charles. That was really interesting. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of interest in the Q&A session on Thursday the 11th at one o'clock. Um, so we very much look forward to that and um, we hope to welcome you back then. Thank you.